There isn't much time left. What's already been done can't be reversed. We screwed up. Let me give you all a little backstory. I'm not able to disclose my name in fear of outing myself to higher authorities looking to corrupt what happened in Antarctica. Just know that I was part of a research team tasked with investigating a series of seismic disturbances which was affecting the local wildlife within the Wilkes Line region of Antarctica. I was a miner sent to decipher what exactly was causing these disturbances, along with my excavatory team and seismologists. I am not able to disclose their names as well, but for clarity's sake, we all call them Beck, Liam and David. Beck had been a colleague of mine for years, and we had grown to become best friends. Liam and David were two seismologists from Stanford University who were called in for the expedition. The details for why we were chosen aren't really important. It was supposed to be a normal scientific expedition with zero excitement, just the job I had to do that would get me a considerable amount of money afterwards. My first hint that something was off was that when my team and I were loaded onto the transport to head to Wilkesland, we noticed that two military ospreys were docked with our transport. Did they tell you why we've got two platoons of soldiers coming with us to dig through ice? Beck asked, his brow raised with confusion. We've never been on an expedition this official before. They might just be taking precautions, I assured, though I knew this wasn't the case. Something still felt off. I still don't understand why a few earthquakes weren't the need for military involvement though. I don't like it, Beck said. You will like it after we get paid. Twenty grand, man. You can't pass something like that up, I said. God, was I foolish. Once our team of 20 miners was assembled, Beck and me included, along with our two seismologists, we set off for Antarctica. The ride there was quieter than I expected. Some of those men I've worked with for years, and they were never this quiet. I could tell they felt something was off. I had no idea how cold it would be when we touched down in Wilkesland. Being used to the Colorado mines, I was no stranger to some very cold weather, but that didn't prepare me for this. We set up camp about a mile from where the disturbances were being traced. Liam and David set up the seismograph and waited for the activity. You know, it just occurred to me, Beck said. Why would they need a mining crew for something like this? And the military? Why are we digging for earthquakes? Nothing is making any sense. Beck had a point. None of it did make any sense. At that point though, I didn't care. We were getting paid $20,000 for this. While I was pondering Beck's statement, I was interrupted by an unfamiliar voice calling my name. I looked back to see a man outfitted in assault gear with a rank insignia plastered on his chest. Sorry for just now introducing myself. We were supposed to meet before taking off, but we were cut for time. My name is Colonel Marcus Anton, and I am tasked with leading this expedition, said the man. I paused for a moment, and then asked him why the army escorted us on an expedition to dig for earthquakes. His reply sent shivers down my already freezing spine. The seismic activity we're picking up isn't a series of normal earthquakes. They're rhythmic. We have reason to believe something is under the ice causing the earthquakes. Your seismologist buddies are only here to confirm a few suspicions of ours, but we need you and your mining team to find out what the hell is under the ice, explained Anton. So the army is here because whatever is under the ice might want to kill us? That's comforting, said Beck, growing more and more wary about the expedition. It's just a precaution. Don't let our presence intimidate you. We're here to keep you safe, reassured Anton. Since it was getting late and the sun was setting, we decided to travel to the center point of where the earthquakes were taking place in the morning and start the excavation from there. When we arrived at the location the next day, we were greeted with a colony of penguins standing in a circle right in the middle of Ground Zero. They looked as if they were pecking at the ground, attempting to unearth something from beneath the ice. How much do you want to bet it's aliens? I said to Beck, attempting to calm his nerves. Beck just looked at me, his face looking paler than normal. 
Don't joke like that, man. You know how superstitious I am. Words of power, Beck said. We shooed away the penguins and started to set up the dig site. Just as we were about to start, we felt a deep rumbling within the ground. The ground was pulsating at a steady tempo, and then abruptly stopped. Dave said that the seismograph was showing wave patterns that matched each other exactly and were spaced perfectly. This only confirmed Anton's suspicion that something foreign was under the ice. We started digging right where the penguins had been, hoping to find what was causing these waves. Three hours had passed until one of the miners found something. About 20 feet under the ice was a large metallic pill-shaped object. I can't remember the exact dimensions, but it had to be somewhere around 20 to 30 feet long with a width of about 10 to 15 feet. Banging against the thing revealed that it was hollow, or most of it was. The metal that coated the object was unlike any material I'd ever seen before. It was perfectly smooth, with none of our tools being able to put any kind of scratch or dent in the thing. It was unbelievably shiny as well, with the chrome surface displaying our reflections perfectly. Anton ordered all of the miners to clear out the chasm we created. He said he wanted to give the object a surge of electricity and see if they could time the wave emissions. Beck could no longer contain his panic. Wait a second, what are you trying to do, Colonel? This thing is obviously alien and you're trying to wake it up, he said. There's no need to worry. This is why we brought the armed forces here. We need to see what this thing is, Anton explained. He then yelled for two of his soldiers to unload what looked like a generator off the one spray they took to Ground Zero. I was more confused than I had been during this entire trip. How did they know to bring this high-tech generator? How much was the colonel letting on? If they knew this much, then why was a mining team of 20 men who were local to Colorado vital to the mission? My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of an electrical discharge. The seismic waves began again. They powered the damn thing, said Beck. The rhythmic waves became faster. The ground was shaking more violently now, with Beck and I struggling to keep our balance. The wave frequencies increased in speed by tenfold, until it suddenly stopped again. Looking back, I wished Beck and I got a head start and ran when we had the chance. The entire Antarctic was dead silent for what felt like an eternity but what probably lasted a good 10 seconds. Then, it happened. It's hard to describe, but I'll do my best to convey what the hell came out of that chasm. It was an arm. The arm was eerily human-like, but had three fingers and two elbow joints instead of one. It was metallic in nature, but fluid. It's hard to describe, but think of when gallium is placed in water and the metal turns into a liquidized state. That's what the surface of the arm looked like. What looked like wires peppered the surface of the arm, which were active and constantly convulsed in odd patterns. The massive arm grabbed the ground and clenched its three-fingered hand. Three more identical appendages erupted from the chasm and proceeded to hoist the monster from its icy tomb. It was massive. When fully emerged, the thing stood almost 50 feet in height. How it managed to fit inside its comparatively small capsule is beyond me. Its body consisted of what looked like a torso with an exposed rib cage, 12 wire-like appendages protruding from the bottom. At the end of the appendages were red lights, which I assumed were its eyes. Each eye acted independently, surveying the area by whipping around in every direction. Beck and I were at a considerable distance away from the chasm after being ordered to evacuate earlier. Anton was with the soldiers at the chasm when the generator was activated. Their efforts to fight the thing were useless. What it did to them still gives me nightmares. The flailing wires that pepper the thing's legs seem to extend at lightning fast speed. Each one targeted a different soldier and instantly impaled them. The beast didn't even need to move. It just stood there while its wires did the dirty work. Anton got the worst. The thing seemed to take special care in wrapping its two wires around Anton's waist 
proceeding to rip him in half. After it slaughtered all of the soldiers effortlessly, they went for the Osprey and used this wires to plug in to the Osprey. Beck and I, half running away and half entranced by this thing, watched as it seemed to fiddle with the plane's mechanics. All of a sudden, the top of its torso opened up. Out of the opening came what sounded like a combination between a screech and a series of beeps. It was loud, very loud. Beck dropped to his knees, holding his ears in pain. The screams were almost rhythmic, like the seismic waves it produced underground. I propped Beck on my shoulder and ran towards the direction our transport was stationed, hopefully outrunning whatever this thing was. I looked back to see the monstrosity raising one of its slender legs into the air. For a moment, I was puzzled, until it brought its leg down on the icy tundra, causing a shockwave of monumental proportions. Beck and I were caught in the ensuing wave. The last thing I remember seeing was a wave of ice and snow, and then total darkness. When I woke up, I was in an unfamiliar hospital. An older man in a suit was waiting in a chair next to my bed. You're damn lucky to be alive. You and one of the seismologists were the only survivors, said the man. But Beck, he was with me. Where? I was cut short by the man. Your friend's body was recovered a couple yards from where we found you. He didn't make it. I'm sorry, said the man. How did you find me? I asked. The seismologist that survived made it to your transport and told the pilot to call for backup. We found you half a mile from the transport, he said. Do you know what that thing was? Why were we sent to dig it up? I asked. We'll explain everything to you when you heal. Until then, get some rest. Eventually, I learned that what we discovered was a biomechanical weapon that was alien in origin. They're now calling it the Shock Strider in reference to its multiple abilities revolving around seismic waves. The army eventually took it down with five MOP2 bunker buster bombs five miles from where it had emerged. This would have put me at ease until I learned of one last haunting fact. When the Shock Strider grappled the Osprey with its wires, it proceeded to hack into its communication systems. We don't know how, but the thing managed to send multiple frequencies into deep space with a shrieking noise it emitted. To all of you listening to this, I want you to look around, look at the life you live, and make the most of it while you can. The thing we unearthed in the Antarctic knew it couldn't take this planet alone, so it called more of its kind to help. There isn't much time left. There are more of those things out there. And they're coming. <laughs>